Hi everyone, I'm Ishraq from Ace Academy and in today's video I'll be solving the Major 2022 Variant 2 of Biology Paper 1. I hope you find it useful for your upcoming exams. Now we'll begin with question number 1 which reads Diagram shows a plant cell. The cell is stained with iodine solution. Now look at the diagram. After staining with iodine solution, what are the colors of the cell wall and the starch grain? Now the first thing we need to know here is that iodine solution is usually brown, but in the presence of starch, color of the solution turns from brown to blue-black. So it tells us it tells us to look at the color of the cell wall and the starch grain. Cell wall, as we know, contains cellulose and not starch. So iodine solution will remain brown there. And the starch grain, as the name suggests, it contains starch. So iodine solution will remain blue-black when it's added to starch grains. Hence, for our answer, cell wall will remain brown and starch grain will turn blue-black. Let's look at the options. In options A and B, cell wall turns blue-black, so they're incorrect. In option C, cell wall, cell wall is orange-brown and the starch grain is blue-black. This is probably our right answer. And in option D, they're both, both orange-brown. This is incorrect. So our final answer should be C. Moving on to the next question. It says, xylem vessels are cells that have become adapted for conduction and support. Which two adapt adaptations assist them in these functions? The, for conduction and support. Let, now let us look at the options. Option A says, presence of nucleus and cytoplasm. Now this is incorrect because the presence of organelles like nucleus and cytoplasm, they interfere with conduction, so they don't help. This is wrong. Option B says, lack of cytoplasm and woody cell walls. Lack of cytoplasm, this helps with, with conduction, and the woody cell walls, they help with support because xylem vessels contain lignin, which prevents the, which makes the cell wall stronger and prevents the plant from wilting. So B could potentially be our answer. But let's look at the other ones. Option C says lack of a nucleus and presence of cytoplasm. Again, the presence of cytoplasm hinders with conduction, so C is also wrong. And D says presence of cytoplasm, again, presence of cytoplasm is not, it should not be a part of our answer. D is also wrong. Our correct answer should be B. Question number three, what is diffusion? Okay, to solve this question properly, we need to know the formal definition of diffusion, which is the movement of particles down a concentration gradient. Now we need to see which option fits, the, fits, that, fits that definition the best. Option A says movement of particles by the air. This is wrong because diffusion isn't restricted to mediums such as the air or any other medium. Option B says movement of molecules down a concentration gradient. This might be correct. This is very close to our original definition. But let's look at the other ones. C says movement of molecules in a heated liquid. Again, diffusion isn't restricted to mediums such as heated liquids. This is a, this is a wrong answer. And D says movement of particles up a concentration gradient. This is completely opposite of our definition. In diffusion particles move up and down the concentration gradient. So our correct answer should be B. Now on to the next question. Number four. Some of you may find this a little tricky, so we should pay attention. Number four says, the rate of nitrate ion absorption by a root hair cell was measured at different soil nitrate concentrations. At X, the concentration of nitrate in the soil is the same as in the cell. Which graph shows how the rate of absorption varies with nitrate concentration in the soil? Now let us look at the graph. At graph A, the rate increases from 0 to x, and it continues to increase from x onwards. This could be our, this could, we could, we could start off with our right answer, because from 0 to x, it increases due to active transport. The ions move up the concentration gradient, and after that, when the concentration of nitrate in the soil is higher than in the cell, it just, con rate continues to increase due to diffusion. A could be our correct answer. But let's look at the other ones. B. In B from 0 to X, nitrate, con nitrate absorption increases. This is right. But after that, it becomes constant. 
this really shouldn't happen because even a even after the nitrate concentration in the soil is higher than, than in the cell, the ions still move into the cell by diffusion. So B is wrong. In option C, it says that according to option C, no nitrate ions are absorbed from 0 to X. This is wrong because due to active transport, both nitrate ions still move into the cell against their concentration gradient. So C is wrong. And D, D, D is also the same, wrong because of the same reason as C. Nitrate ions have to move into the cell by active transport. That's the speciality of root hair cells. So our correct answer is A. Now on to number five. Number five reads, amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starch to maltose. Students set up an experiment to investigate the effect of different temperatures on the action of amylase on starch solution. They measured am uh, amount of starch remaining after 30 minutes at different temperatures. Which graph would you expect the students to draw from their results? So this is a product remaining against temperature graph. Now let us look at the results. According, graph A says amount of starch increases as temperature increases. No, this shouldn't happen because if the temperature increases, the rate of amylase activity should increase, meaning that more starch should be broken down into maltose. So amount of starch should really decrease. Hence, A is wrong. B, B is also wrong because of the same reason as A. At, the, at, at such low temperatures, if temperatures increase from such low temperatures, amount of starch should really decrease. Now, number C. According to number C, amount of starch decreases with temperature up until passing a certain temperature, which is between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius. This actually makes sense because amylase is an enzyme found in the body and this temperature right here, it is close to body temperature. So when this temperature is exceeded, when the temperature is higher than body temperature, the amylase is denatured so the activity decreases and the amount of so the amount of starch remaining increases after this temperature has been exceeded. C is probably our answer. But let's let us look at D. Again, in D, amount of starch after 30 minutes increases when temperature is increased. No. For same as A and B, this is not the correct answer. The correct answer should be C. Number six. Which statement identifies the optimum or best temperature for enzyme activity? Let us look at the options. It is the highest temperature at which any enzyme activity happens. Now for this question, I want you to look at a graph. This one of rate of, rate of acti enzyme activity against temperature. For option A to be correct, the highest temperature at which any enzyme activity happens, the optimum temperature would have to be somewhere around this region before 60 degree, which really isn't the best temperature for enzyme activity because at this point, the rate of reaction has almost almost hit zero. So A is not our correct answer. For B, it is the highest temperature that does not destroy an enzyme. Again, that would mean our optimal temperature would have to be somewhere around 60, where, where all the enzyme just before all the enzymes have been destroyed by te a high temperature, which is again, not, not, not the best for enzyme activity, hence B should also not be our answer. Number C says, option C says, it's the lowest temperature that denatures an enzyme. Now, how can this be right? If the enzyme is denatured at this temperature, it is obviously not good for our enzyme activity. So C is also not our answer. Final option is D. D says it is the temperature that produces the highest rate of enzyme activity. Let's look at our graph. Yes, as we can see, at the high, the highest rate of enzyme activity, D, at this tem which is at this temperature, we, this, this is potentially where we are going to get our best enzyme, uh, be, the best activity from our enzyme. Hence, D should be our answer. Number seven. A plant has leaves with both green and white areas. One of its leaves is par partly covered with aluminum foil which blocks light. The plant is then placed under a lamp for 24 hours. After this time, 
Discs are cut from the areas of the leaf shown and dusted with iodine solution. Now we already know that iodine changes color from brown to blue-black when starch is present. Now let us look at the areas from which the disc has been cut. W, X, Y, and Z. Now for W and X, they're in the white regions with no chlorophyll, so they won't photosynthesize and they won't produce any starch. This question basically asks us which of these four discs will contain starch. W and X won't because they don't photosynthesize. Now, Y and Z, they are in the green regions, so they do have chlorophyll. They've, but C, Z won't photosynthesize because the aluminum foil blocks out sunlight from it, preventing photosynthesis. Hence, no starch is present here. So the only region where starch is present is Y. Now, do any of the options contain only Y? Yes, they do. So the answer should be D. Number eight. Which row shows the effect of nitrate ions on plant growth and the reason for this effect. Now, for those of you who don't know, nitrate ions are used for protein synthesis, which is used by plant cells for growth. It's also used for making chlorophylls. Now, let us look at the options. Option A says, nitrate ions have no effect on plant growth. This is wrong because nitrate ions are used for protein synthesis, which are used for growth. So, option A is already wrong. B says, Nitrate ions increase increase the plant growth, which is correct. And the reason for this is that less chlorophyll is made. No, this is wrong, because if nitrate, nitrate ions are used up, they'll be used up to make proteins and chlorophyll. And so, if anything, more chlorophyll should be made. Option C says, nitrate ions decrease plant growth. No, this is also wrong. Nitrate ions don't decrease plant growth. For option B, Option D. Nitrate ions increase plant growth. Yes, that's right. And that's because more proteins are proteins are made. That's what I said. Nitrate, uh, nitrate ions are used for protein synthesis, which are in turn used for growth. So our correct answer should be D. Number nine, the question says, the experiment shown was set up and left for 30 minutes. The membrane is permeable to sugar and water, but not permeable to starch or protein. After 30 minutes, samples of water in the beaker were tested with Bayonix reagent, Bayonix reagent, and iodine solution. Now, we already know what iodine solution does, but for your information, Bayonix reagent changes color from blue to red if reducing sugars are present. And Bayonix reagent, it changes color from blue to purple in the presence of proteins. Question says, which colors were obtained with these tests? So, let's look at the apparatus. Inside the membrane, we have a mixture of starch and amylase solution. Amylase solution contains amylase enzyme, which is a protein. It breaks starch down into reducing sugar. According, so, our, so at some point, our solution will our solution inside the membrane will contain a mixture of starch, reducing sugars, and amylase. According to the question, only the reducing sugar will be able to travel uh, will be able to diffuse across the membrane and into the water. Starch is, is, but the membrane is not permeable to starch or protein. So at the end of the reaction, in, end of the hydrolysis of starch and starch for am amylase, we'll only have, the water will only contain reducing sugar. So the only positive test we'll get is for Benedict's test. And for our final results, Benedict's reagent will turn red and Biot Biot test will remain blue, and the iodine test it remains brown. Now, do we have any of the options? Do we have the same matching results? No, option A, no. Bayonix test is blue. Option A is immediately ruled out. For B, B could be our answer. But let's look at the other ones. In C. Add in turns blue-black, so no, it's ruled out as well. And in D, it by test produces purple, purple reagent, so no, it's also wrong. So our correct answer for this one, it should be B. Now for our for our next question, number ten says sometimes gallbladders become infected and have to be surgically removed. How will this affect the functioning of the body? For those of you who don't know. 
The gallbladder stores bile, which emulsifies fats and helps in lipid digestion. Now let's look at the options. A says that it reduces the digestion of carbohydrates. This is completely wrong. Gallbladders don't play any gallbladder don't play any role in the digestion of carbohydrates. B says that it reduces the liver's ability to convert gly- glucose to glycogen. Again, this is also wrong because the gallbladders only secrete bile near the small intestine and not not anywhere on the liver. Option C says it reduces the amount of glycerol absorbed from the alimentary canal. Now this one, this option is potentially correct because lipids are broken down into fatty acids and glycerols, which are nutrients, and they can then be absorbed from the gut. Option C is probably our correct answer, but we'll still look at option D. Option D says it reduces the volume of stored urine. No, this is wrong. As fatty acids and glycerols are nutrients, so they're absorbed and they're not not stored in urine as waste products, so they wouldn't be there in the first place. So option D is also wrong. And our final answer is C. Now, on to number 11. What is an example of assimilation? To solve this question, we need to remember the formal definition of assimilation, which is which basically says how products of digestion are used up in cells. Now let us check out the options. Option A reads, absorption of glycerol into lacteals. No, this one should be wrong because while glycerol is a product of digestion, just saying that they're absorbed into lacteals doesn't really say how they're used up in cells. So no, this isn't exactly assimilation. Option B says the breakdown of glycogen to glucose in the liver. This is also wrong because glycogen isn't a product of digestion. For option C, it says building of proteins from amino acids. This actually makes sense because amino acids, they are products of digestion and they are used up in cells for protein synthesis. So this actually fits our definition. And option D, it says release of hormone from a gland. It doesn't that doesn't fit our definition at all. Releasing hormones from a gland doesn't say, say which products of digestion are, are used and how they're used in a cell. So this is very indirect, so this is also wrong. B is also wrong. Our correct answer should be C. Number 12 says, a student set up an experiment to investigate the rate of transpiration in a plant. The student set up two identical sets of apparatus. One was placed in a room at 20 degrees Celsius with bright light and one in a room at 20 degrees Celsius in the dark. Which graph shows the best result? Let us look at the graphs. Graph 1. Graph 1 actually makes sense because in the dark, the stomata remain closed, so transpiration doesn't really occur. Not a lot of water is lost, so there is not no, no significant change in mass. But in the light, stomata is open, so a lot of water is lost by transpiration, so mass decreases. A is probably our correct answer, but I'll still look at the other options for you. In option B, mass, uh, mass of the plant decreases in the dark. This really shouldn't happen because, again, as I mentioned, in the dark, the stomata are closed, so no transpiration occurs, no water is lost. So B is wrong. Option C is also wrong, but in a different way. Although here the mass increases, it's not supposed to. Because in the dark, processes that add to the mass of the plant, such as photosynthesis, even they can't happen because there's no light. Hence, C is also wrong. The mass should just stay uh, stay constant. Option D. D is also wrong because, again, as I mentioned in in B, the mass of the plant in the dark should not decrease. There is no transpiration there. No water is lost. So our only correct and sensible answer is A. Moving on to number 13. What is the main cause of water moving up to the leaves in xylem vessels? Now, just to put it simply, water moves up to the leaves in xylem vessels because of transpiration. This happens when water evaporates from the walls of the mesophyll cells. That's basically transpiration. Now, one of our options quite accurately already spells that out for us. That is 
option C. But I'll still look at the other options for you, just in case. Option A says active transport. No, that is wrong because in active transport, some substances are carried against the trans against the concentration gradient, whereas in xylem vessels, water water just moves down the water potential gradient. So option A is wrong. Option B, evaporation from the epidermis of the leaf. No, water doesn't evaporate from the epidermis of the leaf. It there's usually a moist lining found on the walls of the mesophyll cell. That's where that's where the water is usually found, found and for, that's from where it basically evaporates. So B is also wrong. And D, use of water in photosynthesis. Now this might, some of you might write the answer as D, but this is also wrong because usually when water is lost due to photosynthesis, that doesn't create a pool in the xylem vessel because that loss is made up for from processes such as respiration where water is released as a byproduct. So D is also wrong. Our correct answer should be C. Number 14. Which blood vessels link directly to the heart transport deoxygenated blood? For this question, we'll look at a diagram which shows the flow of blood through the heart. In this diagram, the blue shaded regions that's, that's where all the deoxygenated blood flows and the yellowish brown shaded region, that's where oxy the oxygenated blood flows. So we'll look at the options and just see if the blood vessels mentioned in the options, they carry deoxygenated blood. Option A says aorta and pulmonary artery. Let us check the diagram. The aorta, no, it carries oxygenated blood, but the pulmonary arteries, they carry deoxygenated blood. Option so option A is wrong, but that's because the aorta carries oxygenated blood. Option B, option B also has the aorta, so it's automatically wrong. Option C says vena cava and pulmonary artery. We already know that the we have already seen that the pulmonary artery it is in the blue, so it contains deoxygenated blood. What else? The vena cava. Yes, both the vena cava they're in the blue region, so they both con carry deoxygenated blood. C is probably our answer. But just to be sure, let's look at D. D says vena cava, which is right, and pulmonary vein. Now the pulmonary vein, is, as we can see, is in the yellow region. It carries oxygenated blood from the lungs. So our only correct option should be C. Number 15. The diagram shows the right side of the human heart when the ventricle is relaxed. Which row describes the position of valve X and valve why when the ventricle contracts? Now, for this for this question, we need to consider how blood flows through through, through the heart. For this re for this structure for this specific side of the heart, blood enters through the atrium, then reaches the ventricle, and when the ventricle contracts, passes through this region, which since this is the right side of the heart, is the pulmonary artery. So, which row describes the position of valve X and valve Y? When the ventricle contracts, blood moves from this region to pulmonary artery over here. So, this valve Y, it should remain open. And to prevent blood from entering this region, to prevent backflow into the atrium, prevent black backflow from here, X should remain closed. So, Y should remain open. That rules out A and C, and X should rem X should remain closed. That rules out option D. So our correct final answer should be B. Let's move on to the next question, which says which component of the blood stimulates the formation of fibers to help seal a wound. Let's look at the options. Option A says plasma. No, this is wrong. The plasma doesn't stimulate formation of fibers. It is just a solvent medium and a medium for transport. So A is wrong. Option B says platelets. Now the platelets are actually, they, sim they stimulate the conversion of fibrinogen into, fi into fibrin, which forms the fibers that result in blood clot. So B is our most likely answer, but let's look at the other ones still. 
C says red blood cells. Red blood cells, they get caught up in the fiber, and that's how the blood blood clot is formed, but they don't really s stimulate the formation of fibers or are related to the formation of fibers in any way, so C is wrong. D, white blood cells. White blood cells also, they don't have a role in the formation of fibers, they just make sure that any pathogens that may enter from the wound are destroyed. So our correct answer should be B. Now let's look at number 17. Diagram shows a cell. We can see chemicals leaving and entering the cell. Which process in the cell is represented by the movement of substances as shown in the diagram? So let's see the way these chemicals move. One mole of, this is glucose, C6H12O6, that's glucose. One mole of glucose enters the cell and six mole of oxygen enters the cell. Whereas six mole of carbon dioxide and six mole of water they leave the cell. Now this question is easier to solve if I put the, if I put the movement of these substances in an equation form. So one mole of glucose and six moles of oxygen. They enter the cell. and 6 mole of carbon dioxide plus 6 moles of water they leave the cell. Now in this manner does the equation seem familiar to familiar to some of you? Well maybe it'll be easier if I add plus energy on this side. For those of you who still couldn't figure it out, this is the general equation for Arabic respiration, which should be our answer. So does any of that? Yes, A says Arabic respiration. A is our answer. We don't really need to look at the other ones here. For option 18, for sorry, for number 18, four flasks are sterilized and set up as shown. Which flask will show signs of fermentation and Arabic respiration after one hour? Option A option in option A, the setup contains dried yeast and water. Fermentation won't really happen here because the yeast then needs some sugar source to respire on, which is not present here. So A is wrong. B again, there is no sugar source here, so B is also wrong. Yes, in C and D, you can see the sugar source has been added. So where is the difference? Yes, option C is kept in refrigerator at 4 degrees Celsius and D is kept in a warm room at 20 degrees Celsius. I think option C is wrong because at 4 degrees Celsius that temperature, the temperature is way too low for fungus such as yeast to survive. So for that reason no fermentation will happen because the yeast can survive at such low temperatures. It's way too cold for them. And D is a much more optimum temperature for them. So. D should be our answer. Uh, go on to number 19, which says, the graph shows the depth and rate of breathing in an individual doing four different levels of activity. Same scale for volume is used in each graph. Which graph shows the individual being most active? Now to find the individual who is being most active, we have to find the individual who has the highest number of breaths. So for that, we we need we need to count the number of breaths in each in each graph since they all run for the exact same amount of time. Let's look at graph A. You can do this by counting like this. From here to here, there is one, there is one breath. So person A has one, two, three, four five and more than 5.5 breaths per minute. Person B has one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, 
9, 10, and 11. 11 breaths so per minute, so B is more likely to be our answer than A. Option C has 1, 2, and 2.5, so no, that's, that's not higher than 11, that's not our answer, and D is also quite obviously not our answer. B has the highest number of breaths, so person B is being the most active. B is our answer. Now, number 20. Which graph shows the changes in concentration of urea and glucose in the blood during kidney dialysis? Again, we have to check all the graphs. The graph for option A says, no, this should be really wrong because the concentration of urea should not remain constant. That's because the dialysis, the function of the dialysis machine is to basically do the job of the kidney, which is to remove harmful substances such as urea out of the blood. So urea concentration should decrease. A is not our answer. B, no, at B, B is also not our answer because here the concentration of urea increases. So no, that doesn't happen during kidney dialysis. B is also wrong. Option C. Concentration of urea decreases and glucose concentration remains constant. I'll explain I'll explain why that is after we solve D. D concentration of urea decreases and so does the concentration of glucose. Now the reason I think D is wrong is because Glucose concentration in the blood should stay constant. And that is for two reasons. Number one is the dialysis fluid. It contains equal concentration of glucose to prevent any movement of glucose from blood into the dialysis fluid. Now why it does that is because, as I mentioned, the job of the dialysis fluid is basically to act like a kidney. And the kidney only removes harmful substances from the blood. Glucose isn't really harmful. It's actually beneficial, so concentration of glucose should stay constant. Hence, our correct answer should be C. Now let's look at number 21. Number 21, the question says, Diagram shows a cross-section of the human skin. Which structures are involved in maintaining a constant body temperature? So basically, which structures here help with thermal thermoregulation? Structure number one, these are basically the blood capillaries that are close to the skin surface. They help by controlling vasodilation or vasoconstriction. Basically, they control how much blood passes through, passes near the skin, so how much heat from the blood is lost by radiation. So yes, they're involved. Structure two, these are, these are actually the receptors. They detect change in body temperature and send nerve impulses that stimulate responses such as vasodilation, vasoconstriction, shivering, or sweat production. So yes, structure two is also involved. Structure three. These are the sweat glands. They secrete sweat, and when the sweat makes makes its way up to the skin up to the skin surface and evaporates from there, that produces a cooling effect which lowers body temperature. So yes, structure three it also helps with thermoregulation. Option four, such a structure four. Yeah, this is the subcutaneous tissue which contains fats which actually help with insulation. So yeah, they prevent heat loss. They're also involved in maintaining a constant body temperature. All the structures here, one, two, three, and four, they should be part of our answer. Hence, our answer is B because it's the only one that has all the options. Moving on to number 22. The graph shows changes in a person's body temperature plotted against time. What could cause the changes in body temperature in periods 1 and 2? Now we can see period 1, the temperature increases from normal and in period 2, the temperature decreases from that increased temperature back to around normal body temperatures. So we can deduce that period 1, during period 1, some outside activity happens that increases the temperature and period 2 is just the response from the body.
So let's see which options are the most likely pair. Let's check the options for period one. For A, it says reduced air temperature. Now that doesn't really make sense because if air temperature was reduced, then the body's temperature should have also decreased. But here in the graph, we can see that the body's temperature is actually increased. So A is wrong. B also contains, B also says reduced air temperature, so it's wrong for the same reason. C, vigorous exercise. Yes, C makes sense. For C, period one makes sense because during vigorous exercise, the muscles contract more, so more respiration happens. And res an aerobic respiration, it is basically an exothermic reaction, so heat is produced and temperature increases. So this makes sense. And the response to that is increased sweating. Yes, that also that's also sensible because due to increased sweating more evaporation happens at the skin surface so a greater cooling effect is induced and body temperature should decrease c is most likely our answer but i'll still look at option d option d period one it says vigorous exercise and at d it says shivering now shivering is actually a mechanism that is used to increase body temperature because during shivering the skeletal muscles they contract and relax very quickly so Again, a lot of lot of energy is needed, a lot of respiration happens. Respiration is an exothermic reaction, so heat is produced. So temper so during shivering temperature shouldn't decrease, rather it should increase. Period two here is wrong, E is wrong. Hence our correct answer is C. Now moving on to number twenty three. Diagram shows a section through the human brain. Which part of the brain controls the rate of breathing? Now, the rate of breathing is actually something that happens subconsciously. We need to keep, it, keep that in mind while answering this question. Option A is this region of the brain, which is the cerebrum. Cerebrum actually controls conscious, pro conscious processes like the words that we speak or the thoughts that come to our mind. So that is not, that has nothing to do with the rate of breathing. So a is not our answer. Cerebrum does not contribute to the rate of breathing whatsoever. Option B says, option B is the cerebellum. Cerebellum, it controls voluntary action such as um, balance or posture that we have to learn, but once we learn it, we get a hang of it and it happens subconsciously. Breathing is not something we learn. So it's not controlled by the cerebe cerebellum. Hence, B is wrong. Now, D. D is very small, but we can see this is the pituitary gland. It secretes ADH hormone, which is used for osmoregulation. And not for, so it, it, it's also not involved in the rate of breathing. So D is wrong. Our last option is C, the medulla. The medulla controls subconscious metabolic activities, such as heartbeat, or digestion, and also the rate of breathing. Hence, C should be our answer. Our answer is medulla. Correct option is C. On to our next question. Which diagram shows how light from a distant object is focused onto the retina to form a clear image? The keywords in this question are distant object and that we need to form a clear image. So let us look at diagram number one, diagram A. Okay, the light rays seem to be coming from a distant object. That part is right. And they are refracted so that the light rays converge exactly on the retina. This seems like an accurate diagram, but still we'll look at the other options. Option B. Light rays converge at the retina, but as we can see, light rays before entering the eye, they come from an object that is not distant, that is actually very close to the eye. The object we can see is over here. So B does not fit the requirements of our question. It's not a wrong diagram, but it just doesn't fit the question. 
So B is wrong. C again, light rays are coming from an object that is over here, very close to the eyes. So C is wrong. In option D, the light rays do seem to come from a distant object, but then again, they refract it such that the light rays, they don't converge on the retina, so we won't have a clear image. Our image will be blurry. So option D is also wrong. Hence, our correct answer is A. The next question, number 25. Which condition causes an increased blood glucose concentration? This is a basic question, but let's look at the options. Option A, a condition causing sufferers to reduce food intake to extreme levels. This one doesn't make sense because if we reduce food intake, then we basically also reduce the glucose intake in our body. So blood glucose concentration decreases rather than increasing. A does not fit our answers. A is wrong. B, a genetic disorder causing too much insulin to be secreted. Again, this is also wrong because insulin actually converts glucose uh, glucose to glycogen. So if more insulin is secreted, more glucose will be converted to glycogen. Hence, blood glucose concentration will decrease. B is also wrong. C. A condition causing a reduction in the number of red blood cells. Number of red blood cells does, do, doesn't directly affect the blood glucose, glucose concentration. Blood cells, they only... They only transport oxygen. Hence, C is also wrong. Option D, our final option. Condition causing too much adrenaline to be secreted. This one actually makes sense because it, one of the one of the key functions of adrenaline is that it stimulates the conversion of glycogen to glucose. Hence, glucose up uptake in muscles increases. And when glucose uptake, uptake in muscles of heart and lungs increases, heartbeat and breathing rate increases, which is, which are, these two are also other key functions of adrenaline. So basically, yes, D is the only answer that makes sense. Moving on to number 26. Diagram shows the bones of the human forelimb. Which row names the three bones? Now, Right off the bat, we can identify number one as the humerus. How can we do that? Well, this is easy because the two of the easiest way to identify the humerus is by the ball and socket joint at the shoulder, which we can see right here, and the hinge joint at the elbow. The humerus is, in, is involved in both these joints. So as we can see, this bone, number one, is involved in a ball and socket joint and a hinge joint over here. We can safely assume that number one is the humerus. So be number two and three are radius and ulna, but which is which? We can distinguish, uh, for this question we'll focus on the ulna. We'll focus on identifying which one of these is the ulna, and we can distinguish the ulna from the radius in two ways. Number one is the joint over here. The hinge joint with the humerus. This joint is usually formed between the ulna and the humerus. The radius does not form part of the joint. So, as we can see, bone number three, that's what th that's the one that's involved in the joint. So three should be our ulna. But alternatively, another way we can distinguish between the ulna and radius is that the ulna is e is the larger bone. Radius radius is comparatively shorter in length. As we can see, 2 is shorter than 3, so 2 is radius, and 3 is ulna. So, for a correct option, 1 has to be humerus, that rules out C and D. 2 have to be radius, that rules out option A, and 3 has to be ulna. Hence, our correct option is B. Now on to number 27. Which short-term effect is caused by a clean consumption of alcohol? The option, option A says damage to the tissues of the heart. Now, this may happen as, as an effect of excessive consumption of alcohol, but our question asks us for a short-term effect. 
And tissue damage is usually something that happens over a long, long period of consumption. So option A is wrong. Option B says faster transmission of nerve impulses. No, this is wrong because alcohol consumption actually slows down the nerve impulses, not speed them up. B is wrong. Reduce self-control of behavior. Yes, this, this is not only a known effect of alcohol consumption, but it's also that happens for a temporary short amount of time. C is most likely our answer. But still for confirmation, we'll look at D, which says shorter reaction times. Over here in B, we've already established that alcohol actually slows down nerve impulses, which means reaction time should also be longer since it takes more time for the nerve impulses to communicate uh, to be tra transmitted throughout the body. Hence, D is also wrong. Our only correct answer is C. For question number 28, which row shows the characteristic of viruses? Now, to solve this question, we'll first look at the most basic characteristic. A general, general characteristic of virus is that it contains DNA or RNA, which is surrounded by a protein coat called capsid. So yes, this one, this characteristic is correct. And we A, B, and D, they all support this characteristic, so C doesn't, so we can rule out C as our answer. Now onto the next characteristic. Viruses can only be seen under an electron microscope. This is actually true because viruses are microorganisms and they're really small. Smaller than some of the organelles in our reg regular body cells. So yes, they can only be some seen something seen through electron microscope because it it has the highest magnification. Hence, this characteristic is also correct. D does not support it, so we can rule out D. The next characteristic says viruses can only reproduce inside a host cell. This is also correct because they viruses they themselves lack the organelles for reproduction. So this was also correct. It does not support this characteristic. We can rule out A. Now our last characteristic it says that viruses act as decomposers. This one's wrong because viruses real viruses they don't have the organelles, same as here, they don't have the organelles to break down break down other break down other cells or other compounds. Com decomposers are usually other microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi. So viruses are not decomposers. A is wrong and B is our final correct answer. Now on to twenty nine. The graph shows the mass of penicillium grown in a fermenter and the mass of antibiotic produced. When is the penicillium pro producing antibiotic most rapidly? Producing antibiotic most rapidly. So here the question asks us which day, which day the rate of antibiotic production is the highest. One simple way we can tell that is by judging the gradient on the graph at each day. Each day that is mentioned in the options. So option A says day one. The gradient over here is roughly zero. Mass of antibiotic produced is zero. So no, it can't be our answer. At day three, mass of antibiotic increases. The gradient is also increasing. It's obviously higher than A, but yeah, so A, B is more likely to be our answer than A. But let's look at the other options. Option C, day five. At day five here, we can see a rapid increase in mass, highly increasing gradient of the antibiotic curve. So yes, C is more likely to be our answer than B. We can, we can just rule out B here, B is strong. At day eight, day eight over here. Again, the ma here the mass of antibiotic has become constant. It's higher than it was at day five, but the gradient of the graph is again zero. So the while the mass of antibiotics is higher, the rate of production has decreased. It's almost stopped. So the maximum rate of antibiotic production happens at day five. So C is our answer. Now, number 30. 
diagram shows part of the carbon cycle. Look at go, carefully look at this diagram. Which row identifies processes W, X, Y, and Z? Now let us start with Z first. In Z, atmospheric carbon dioxide is used by producers, which are technically plants. So there's only one process that is used by that which uses carbon dioxide in living plants and other producers. That is photosynthesis. So Z should be photosynthesis. Option B says that it is respiration, so option B is wrong. Now let's see the other processes linked with producers. This one, it releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. This one's also quite obvious. This should be respiration. As producers, they, are, they also need respiration to produce energy for their other metabolic activities. So why should also be respiration? In option D, it says combustion. In option B, it says photosynthesis. So those two are wrong. So our answer is narrowed down to between A and C. Let's look at the other, other options. For C, decomposers release oxygen to the atmosphere. Decomposers, we know that they break down, these are mostly bacteria or fungi, they break down organic compounds, compounds and produce, to produce energy for themselves. That is also some version of respiration. So option so X is also respiration. And yes, in option A, it says excess respiration. And in C, it says excess combustion. So C is wrong. Our final answer should be A. For those of you confused, fossilization is the bur is the burning of dead of organic products in organic compounds in dead dead organisms such as plants and animals, and this process usually involves burning them in oxygen, which releases carbon dioxide. So yeah, W is combustion. Now moving on to our next question, number thirty one. An organism such as a mosquito can pass a disease causing organism from one host to another. Which term describes the mosquito? Now to solve this question, we need to identify the mosquito's role in the disease-carrying cycle. The mosquito, it basically acts as an intermediate host. What it does is transfer the pathogen, the disease-causing organism here, from an infected host body to an uninfected host body. Now let's see which term in our options best describes the mosquito like this. Option A says parasite. No, a parasite is actually an organism that needs the host to survive. The mosquito, as I mentioned, acts as a host and does not need another to survive. Now, option B says pathogen. The pathogen is actually the disease-causing organism itself. The one that the mosquito carries is not the mosquito. B is also wrong. Option C says receptor. Now, we have already learned back in question number 21 over here that the receptors are structures that detect changes to body, bodily conditions and report that back to the brain. So, C is also not our answer since mosquitoes don't do that. They're clearly not receptors. Option D says vectors. Now, a vector is essentially an organism which carries and transmits the disease-causing organism, without harming it. The vector and the pathogen, they don't harm each other. So, out of all these terms, the vector is the one that most accurately de de describes the mosquito. Hence, our correct option should be D. Now, on to number 32. What increases in the long term as a result of tropical deforestation? So, option A says, Cloud cover. Now, the reason why I think this is wrong is because of deforestation, there are less trees available, so there's less transpiration and less water va vapor. It, less water vapor is present in air. And since we know that the clouds are mainly composed of these water droplets, the amount of clouds would decrease and cloud cover would also decrease. Hence, A is not our answer. Option B is humidity. 
again, for the same reason as A, humidity is wrong because less trees, less transpiration, less water vapor and air, which by extension means less humidity. Option C says soil erosion. Now, those of you who don't know, trees in the tropical for forest, they provide cover for the soil against rainfall. So when trees are absent, rainfall erodes the topmost layers of the soil, hence soil erosion increases, C is most likely our answer. Option D says soil fertility. Now many of you may be tricked into thinking this is the right answer, but actually this is wrong and let me explain why. Now we've already established in C that soil erosion increases due to topic tropical deforestation. Now when the soil erosion happens, the mineral ions and other nutrients on the in the soil, they either get washed away or they get leached out of the soil, thus soil fertility is reduced. Hence, our only correct answer is C. Now our next question, number 33. It says, which graph shows how the amount of DNA in a cell changes when the cell divides by mitosis? Let's look at our graphs. In graph A, the amount of DNA increases over time. This shouldn't happen because DNA replication, it only occurs during a single stage of the cell division. So amount of DNA should really increase throughout, throughout the cell cycle, but only for like a short period of time. So A is not our answer. Option B, the graph in option B says that the amount of DNA decreases throughout the entire cell cycle. Again, this is also wrong because amount of DNA only decreases once during one stage of cell cycle, which is the cytogenesis, when the cell develop, when the cell cell completely divides. Hence, option B is wrong. In graph C, the amount of DNA in increases in one step, and then it also decreases in one step. But the question here it asks for the amount of DNA in a cell when the cell divides by mitosis. So when a cell divides by mitosis. After cell division, which happens here, the new cells that are produced, they contain the same amount of DNA as the, daughter, as the parent cell, which is over here. So the amount of DNA should decrease from here all the way down to here and not over here. Now, if our question said, uh, said when the cell divides by meiosis, C could have been our answer. But since the question asked for mitosis, the amount of DNA in cell before and after cell, uh, before and after division should be the same. So C shouldn't be our answer for mitosis. Graph in our final option, which is graph D. The amount of DNA increases during one stage, that is the DNA replication stage, and it decreases during cytogenesis, which is also once, which is also happening in one stage and it returns back to normal. The daughter cells over here have the same amount of DNA as the parent cells. So D is logically our correct answer. Moving on to number 34. The diagram shows the human male reproductive system. Which structure may contain sperm? Now, structure A. This is the urinary bladder. This isn't even really part of the human reproductive system, it contains urine and it never really contains sperm. So A is wrong. Option B, it shows the seminal vesicles. And option C, it shows the prostate gland. Now both of the both of these gland both of these are glands which secrete fluids that contain nutrients for the sperm cells and become part of the semen. But B and C, they never really contain sperm. So B and C are also wrong. D is the urethra. The urethra may actually contain sperm, as sperm passes through the urethra before ejaculation. So from, for some time, yes, the yes, structure D, it does contain sperm. D is our correct answer. Moving on to number 35. Some statements about the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, are listed. Which statements about HIV are not correct? So we'll run through these statements and I'll say if they're correct or not. 
its spread can be reduced by using condoms. Yes, that is correct. It can cross the cost of the center. Yes, it actually can because the HIV virus is very small, so the membranes in the placenta are permeable to it. It can be spread by coughing or sneezing. No, this one's actually wrong. Because the human immunodeficiency virus, it is it really can't survive outside of body fluids such as blood or semen. Hence, number three is wrong. Number four says it is the same as AIDS. That is also obviously wrong because AIDS is the disease that is caused by the HIV virus. They're not the same. One is the pathogen and the other is the disease. Number five says it is transmitted in blood and semen. It is also correct, as I've mentioned, that the, those are the only two mediums where the HIV virus can survive. And its spread can be reduced by screening donated blood. Screening blood is a way to identify if the blood contains HIV. And if so, so, yes, it definitely helps reducing the spread as we can identify who, who has the virus in their blood and who doesn't. So our correct option should only have three and four. A has three, but it also has one and six, so A is wrong. B has four, but it also has two and five, so it's also wrong. C has three, but it has two, so it's wrong. And D, it, it has both the non-correct features, so D is our answer. Our next question, number 36, it deals with a diagram which shows a developing fetus in, in, the, in, the uter in the uterus. In this diagram, the fetus is actually in the amniotic sac. So this fluid is surrounded by is mostly amniotic fluid. Let's see what the question wants. Yes. What is the liquid at X called? Now, right off the bat, we have amniotic fluid, which I've already said. This is most likely a correct answer, but let me look at the other options. Option B says that it is blood. Now it can't be blood. Amniotic fluid really doesn't contain any blood. Option C and D say urine and water. Now urine and water are actually part of amniotic fluid, but they also contain other substances like hormones and antibodies, which collectively form the antibiotic, uh, amniotic fluid. So overall, A is our most accurate answer. Now to number 37. Which row shows examples of continuous and discontinuous variation in humans? Now, a continuous variation occurs when, within, when we're talking about a characteristic where there is a range and the characteristic that can be affected by environmental factors. A discontinuous variation, it occurs when the characteristic, the characteristic in question is divided into distinct groups with no, nothing in between. Let me show you how that works. For option A, the continuous variation example is height. Now this is correct because in height there are ranges such as you can be five foot one, five foot two, five foot three in the range, and it can be affected by other factors such as exercise and diet. So A is a correct example of continuous variation. And in discontinuous variation, the example is blood group. Again, this is also a correct example because blood group is divided into distinct groups, into a few distinct groups, such as you can, you can have blood group A or you can have blood group AB, AB positive. There's nothing in between those two groups. So option A is actually correct, but we'll still look at the other options. B says continuous variation. Blood group is an example of continuous variation. We've already established its discontinuous variation, so B is wrong. C says hair color is an example of continuous variation and body mass is an example of discontinuous variation. Body mass is not discontinuous variation. Why is that? Because again, there, there's a range in there and it can also be affected by environmental factors such as diet or the amount of exercise that we do. And C is wrong. And in D, it says height is an example of discontinuous variation. We've already established here in A that it's continuous variation. So D is also wrong. Our correct answer should be A. Moving down to number 38. 
This question is a bit tricky. Diagram shows a family tree for the inheritance of eye color. The allele for, bra for brown eyes is dominant and the allele for blue eyes is recessive. Which people must be heterozygous for eye color? Now, as you can see, the allele for brown eyes is dominant, the allele for blue eyes is recessive. If you, can look, if you look at the family tree, it says number two, two is a female with blue eyes. Since it has blue eyes, it's safe to assume that two is homozygous recessive. So that means it's offspring together with one. They also must have one recessive allele in its genotype. But since they all have brown eyes, which that means they also get one dominant one dominant allele which is presented in their ger genotype. So since they have one dominant and one recessive allele, three and four, the offsprings of one and two, they are both, they both must be heterozygous. So then we can see that the heterozy heterozygous four, it rep reproduces with five to form a blue-eyed offspring here, which is six. So six is also a homozygous recessive, meaning it has two recessive alleles in its genotype. Now that means that means that six gets one of those two recessive alleles from each of its parents. We know it gets one recessive allele from four because it's heterozy heterozygous. Other one it must get from five, but five has brown eyes. That means five has one dominant allele for brown eyes and one recessive value for blue eyes that it passes down to six. So five is also heterozygous. So our correct answer should have three, four, and five. Let's check out the options. In the options, we can see that only one, well, only option C matches my explanation. Three, four, and five. Option A, it contains one and seven. That's wrong. Option B, it contains 2 and 6, which are clearly wrong because they're both homozygous recessive. And in option D, it doesn't contain 3. So, final answer should be C. Now, let's look at the next question. Number of wheat plants in a grass field was counted at monthly intervals. Table shows the result. Since August 2020, the field was mown regularly and used as a football pitch. From this information, which two weeds are the best adapted to survive in mown grass? Now, this question can be solved very easily. We just see our final values are from August 2021. So we just see which weeds have the highest number in, a, in the one year span since which the field was mowed. As we can see, ground cell, there are zero and dog, there are two. They're very low, no low numbers over the year. So they're not well adapted at all. But plantain and dock, the number for these two actually increased from when the lawn was lawn started being mowed. So I think it's safe to say that they are they are the best adapted. So our correct answer should contain both plantain and dandelion, since the question asks for two weeds. Now let's check out the options. Option A, it contains dandelion and dock, not plantain. So A is wrong. Option B, it contains dock and ground cell. Both of them are wrong. So option B is also in turn wrong. Option C, it contains plantain and dandelion. It contains both of, both of our correct weeds. So it might be our correct answer, but let us look at D. D contains plantain, but it doesn't contain dandelion and it contains dock. So D is also wrong. Our final answer, it should be C. Now to our final question for today. Stages in the production of insulin on a commercial scale are listed. What is the correct sequence of events? So these five stages, they are not listed sequentially, and we have to find the correct sequence. Let's look at let's look at the stages. Bacteria produce human insulin. Number two, bacteria reproduce. Number three, the human insulin gene is extracted. Number four, the human insulin gene inserted into bacterial DNA. Number five, human insulin produced on a commercial scale. If we are to place this sequentially, number three should really happen first. Because first we have to take the human 
human insulin gene from a human cell before we add it to the bacteria. So three should be first. And it should be followed by four because now we take this extract, extracted gene and place it in bacterial DNA. So three should be followed by four. What should come next? Yeah, and then we'd see that the genetically engineered bacteria, we see if it pr produces human insulin. So this should be, number one should be our third stage. Our sequence now is three, four, one. And the next stage in order is actually reproducing this bacteria on an in industrial scale. So that is two. Two should be our fourth stage. And our final stage, human insulin produced on a commercial scale. Yeah, that, that is actually the correct final step because when the bacteria reproduce, the whole population, it produces insulin. And when this insulin is, co uh, is collected for commercial scale or commercial sale. So our final stage is number five. Three, four, one, two, five. That should be our correct sequence. Do we have anything in the options that matches that? Option A, three, four, one, five, two. No, it's wrong at the end. A is not our answer. B and C, they have four at the beginning, so those are not our answer. Final option, D. Three, four, one, two, five. Yeah, that is the correct answer. Matches the sequence perfectly. So we are done. That was actually our last question for today. We've completed this paper. I really hope you guys understood the entire explanations. And if you still have any queries, feel free to share those in the comment section down below. Also, if you found this video helpful, please feel free to like and share and subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. You might need those as well. Also, if you're looking for more helpful notes and resources, check out our Facebook and Instagram pages as well as our Discord server. Now, with that being said, I really wish you guys the best of luck for your exams and goodbye.